second year here at Central. And the case that I'm going to be presenting to you guys is Tyler versus Henry County, uh, Minnesota, and how it affects the Fifth Amendment's takings clause and future interpretations of that clause. So a quick overview of this case. Uh, quick questions. Does taking and selling a home to satisfy a debt to the government and keeping the surplus value as a windfall violate the Fifth Amendment taking clause? And is the forfeiture of property worth far more than needed to satisfy a debt a fine in the meaning of the Eighth Amendment? That second question there has got a much more lighter tone as we kind of proceed through this presentation, uh, but the first one is gonna be kind of our chief question at, uh, at hand. So, facts of the case, uh, Geraldine Tyler fails to pay property taxes for five years and it accrues to $15,000 of back taxes. The county forecloses it, sells the property for $40,000 and retains all the proceeds with no recourse measures for Tyler to take. Tyler sues, arguing, says this is a violation of her rights and the district court dismisses, uh, failing to make an Article III uh, injury in fact claim which the Eighth Court, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals affirms. We're gonna cover two concepts real quick, the takings clause and then also common law philosophy very briefly. Uh, the takings clause, many of us might be familiar with the idea of I invoke the fifth, the fifth amendment being used for the right to not self-incriminate. Another very key clause in the fifth amendment is <clears throat> eminent domain and the concept of taking private property or uh, for public uses uh, with just compensation. This is a right that the governments and state governments have. Going back to common law philosophy, uh, this concept of stare decisis, where uh, precedents set by legal cases should determine the outcome of a case with similar facts. There are two very key cases which relate to uh, Tyler v. Gerald, uh, sorry, Tyler v. Uh, Hennepin County, Minnesota. Um, and we'll be looking at those and kind of looking at what is traditionally done with this type of takings case. <clears throat> so, county's view. Uh, we're going to start with two, uh, kind of the common law tradition basis here, which is the Statute of Gloucester from 1278, incredibly dated, uh, and then also a 1790 Virginia statute. So starting with the Statute of Gloucester, this is what uh, <coughs> Counselor Katyal brings up in their oral arguments uh, when they're kind of trying to cite what is traditionally done when a taxpayer or kind of like a deviant taxpayer doesn't hold up their end of the bargain and conditional ownership. <coughs> so. The writ of Sassabit means within two years, if a landlord, not a landlord, but a property owner uh, does not pay taxes or let's say fealty to their board as covered in the oral arguments, uh, the landlord can come in, take the property uh, with the idea of protecting the productivity interests. 1790 Virginia statute is three years of failure to pay back taxes results in a straight forfeiture of property, which is short lived and we'll find out why uh, later on. And then also the chief complaint, that, or the chief defense rather, that the county brings up is that Tyler has no standing and this is once again the Article Three injury in fact claim. <clears throat> so going on, Tyler doesn't have standing and why, they, why do they say that? So what are the kind of elements to this uh, Article Three injury in fact claim? Basically what's being argued in this case is that uh, Geraldine Tyler does not bring up, um, or does not cite rather, a injury that has kind of been incurred upon her by the actions of the state. In this case, it would be a financial injury, the loss of equity and unjust taking. Therefore, also, <clears throat> does not have the particularity in identifying that being the injury claim. And therefore, district court cites there's no right to sue, and the Eighth, court of Cir uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals affirms that finding. Uh, we also get to raise questions of what are conditions of reasonable ownership defined by Minnesota statute. Um, and these kind of reasonable ownership claims are failure to pay ta property taxes, water bills, anything like that. Is that a condition of reasonable ownership? <clears throat> and finally, Tyler seeking fair market value versus just the uh, surplus that was acquired after the county was foreclosed, or sorry, the property was foreclosed. And that difference is $14,000. This opens up a very, very specific legal question which kind of complicates things, where now states and also the justices might have the ability to determine what are the values to private property. All right, let's go over the cases real quick. So Texaco Incorporated v. Short and Nelson v. New York City. So 
uh, the common theme between these two is that the petitioner has negligence. Um, we're going to actually start with Nelson first uh, because it is the closest to Tyler v. Hennepin County. Uh, the petitioner basically fails to bring up water, uh, does not pay water charges, and the country, or not the country, the county, comes in and forecloses the property and retains all the, once again, retains all the proceeds and doesn't allow them any recourse measure to take value. Um, and then in Texaco Incorporated, be short, the property owners at this time, at that time, the petitioners um, had a piece of land and they had mineral interest. They were trying to produce minerals and after failing to take notice of a statutory change within two years of a grace period, uh, which would basically allow them to either continue holding onto the property and also claim that they had not abandoned it, um, because of the failure to kind of take notice of that, once again, the county comes in, uh, Indiana takes the property away from them. So, petitioners. Counselors on their end uh, basically establish a foundation where the county views equity as private property. It's not disputed. So this excess uh, <clears throat> excess funds that the county has taken is still considered equity uh, in terms of, let's say, just compensation. And that is established by Minnesota statute. Addressing the claims that Tyler has no water, uh, the counselor, Counselor Martin, basically points out that the fact that there are no recourse measures in taking the excess funds that the state now has after liquidating the property is in fact a financial injury in regards to the Article Three injury of fact claim. Going also to common law tradition, surplus equity is always returned after a taking. And this was established in McClurmy Maitland, uh, which basically ended the 1790 Virginia statute uh, precedent in that case. That also established forfeitures were limited to title and that excess funds would be always paid to the former owner. And then furthermore, Virginia's court at the time avoided enforcing unjust forfeiture statutes in King v. Mullins, citing that we shouldn't be enforcing highly punitive statutes. Addressing Nelson, <clears throat> Nelson's case does not necessarily answer Tyler's claim because of a key difference. In Tyler's claim, they are trying to uh, access equity after a liquidated sale, where in Nelson, it's more so that they are trying to get the title back, the title of the property back. The United States Department of Justice also weighs in, um, and the, uh, assist <clears throat> the assistant to the Solicitor General, Erica Ross, uh, brings up that both parties can agree that the county's taking is allowed. However, the fact that there are no recourse measures for Tyler to take this now makes it a potentially compensable taking. And therefore, Minnesota's on the hook. Property interest also lies exclusively in fee simple title, which means that the homeowner has absolute rights to the land. Um, and therefore, the statute that Minnesota has does not necessarily allow them to kind of define what property interest is. That might be considered unconstitutional. <clears throat> and also, furthermore, when property interest is taken, it is should be refunded right when the title is seized. What does that mean? Rather than the what's argued for the counties when they're trying to get them to pay back the 25,000, this potentially goes back to the 54,000 where now the state has to act as a real estate agent and determine the value of the property right on title. Addressing that Eighth Amendment claim, once again, it doesn't hold much water. Um, it can be waived, and it was waived in the stipulation and oral arguments, where basically, if Tyler is refunded the excess equity, the Eighth Amendment gets raw dropped. The Eighth Amendment claim gets dropped. And <clears throat> the only reason, the only real substance that this claim has is it's a backup appeal uh, for the uh, petitioner, just in case the Fifth, claim, Fifth Amendment's claim doesn't pass. So let's go to the oral arguments and also the justices' thoughts. So generally, most of the justices appear with, to side with Tyler in the oral arguments, and there's a reason why, uh, we'll get down here uh, shortly. Um, the one exception is that Justice Sotomayor uh, kind of points out and raises the same uh, concern that the county has, where this opens a very complex legal question to what limits do the states have, and in this case also, the justices have, what's the burden they have in determining values of private property, and potentially what that means when it comes to takings and just compensation. Gorsuch also identifies 
Uh, then he disagrees with the district court or the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals that the excess $25,000 was not taken. It is, and he finds that to be the case under the Supreme Court case law and the general precedent established by that. Uh, Jackson furthermore agrees thinking it's highly punitive and then also going back to the uh, signing with Tyler, the justices don't actually address any of Cottonwood's points about Tyler having a standing. This infers that the justices believe Tyler has a standing and a right to sue. Furthermore, Cotillo, uh, Counselor Cotillo, has this theory where uh, the state should have a statutory right to determine what private property is and what traditional re reasonable uh, ownership, uh, sorry, what uh, re conditions of reasonable ownership are, uh, how they can be defined by statute. Um, and many of the uh, <coughs> justices actually disagree with this. Um, and they find that it's very inconsistent uh, with what would be what they could consider the case law and precedent. And let me go back here as well, pointing out that the county's theory may allow for seizures with unreasonable limits. So why does this matter? Uh, it's a case about the Fifth Amendment. It's about property. Uh, what does this have to do with the common layperson? Uh, first of all, it is very formative in how do we interpret the uh, takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Um, but more importantly, what are the limits of power that the justices have and the state has in determining property value when they are coming in and taking private property for a just taking or just compensation for a public use? And how do they define that within just compensation? This potentially allows them to lowball a private property fee simple uh, title owner. Um, and that's what we're kind of really concerned about is this potential of uh, malfeasance, really, uh, on the side of the state. Are there any questions? First, a round of applause for Mr. 